Welcome to the Romanian River Channel and my first impressions of Stellaris, a game made by the Paradox Development Studios and published by Paradox. The game itself is a real-time 4x slash grand strategy game that isn't as complex as it sounds but is pretty much... well, I hope I'm not being too parabol parabolic, hyperbolic here, but it is, in my opinion, the best forex strategy game I've played in, well, however long it's been since Sword of the Stars 1 came out, the original, the vanilla version, not with the expansions. But before we get too much into this, the standard disclaimer applies, i.e. I've gotten a review copy of the game for the purposes of doing this first impressions video from uh, Paradox themselves. And the biasing element here is the fact that I bloody well like for a, like, like is more of a uh, understatement. I bloody well love forex strategy games done well, and this one, well, the mix and match from forex games of your, your like for example, Master of Orion one, two, and even three, and Paradox is more traditional staple of games like Hearts of Iron or more particularly Europa Universalis and to a small degree Crusader Kings 2 makes for an interesting and quite enjoyable product. But before we get too much into details about the mechanics themselves, let's quickly take a look at the settings. In terms of graphics, the game itself is based on the Clausewitz engine from Hearts of Iron and Europa Universalis fame, fairly well improved from Europa Universalis, but it's still basically the same engine. So the models themselves are good, but they're not going to win any graphics porn nominations at the Emmys or something like that. The fact that the engine is so undemanding basically, or non-demanding or however it's said in English, means that there's not really much to tweak at it, because it probably could run even on a Ivy Bridge era integrated GPU. My R9 290 for example has absolutely no bloody issues running this game going full bore in a massive engagement of what was it? 50 versus 50 starships with shit flying all over the place. The one problem with the game I've noticed in terms of the settings menu is that it seems to have a similar glitch to um, Savage Lands. Namely that it keeps defaulting to 1080p when I keep setting it to 720 windowed. This does not seem to have any bearing on the fact that you enter it and you exit without doing anything like for example in Savage Lines. Here it just seems to be defaulting there without any in, without any input or output. The, f the funny thing is it defaults to 1080p but unless you go in the options menu and leave it at 1080p the resolution won't change like it does in Savage Lines. In terms of sound, you have your basic sliders with everything under the sun, including your advisor's volume. If you don't particularly like the little robot helping you with your in tutorial information, and I do recommend you do the tutorials for the first one or two games we play because the mix and match of Forex and Grand Strategy does mean you do have to deal with some things you didn't have to deal with in, for example, Master of Orion or Sword of the Stars. But yeah, the ambient is, the, is quite good, the music is superb, and the effects volume is not nothing to write home about. It isn't, for example, World of Tanks or um, World of Warships level ear porn in terms of realism, but then again, we've never had a lightning-based starship weapon yet, so not much realism to do there. It sounds good, but it isn't as good as some other titles. The gameplay itself, you have 
different pop-ups which I recommend you leave on because while at the beginning you can keep track of things, if you don't get pop-ups in the later stages you can actually forget to do stuff. I forgot one time to actually control my fleet and that did not end well at all. Now you do not get fleet pop-ups, however much you want that. Oh dear god, that was a pretty interesting weapon. The tutorial, in my case I left it, I turned it off and once you turn it off from the in-game option, it stays off. It doesn't turn on with every subsequent game. You can turn it back on from the gameplay options in the menu. Autosave, I'd recommend autosaving to cloud just to have a backup in case your hard drive or SSD decides today is a good day to die. And the autosave frequency, I'd recommend quarterly just to keep down the odds your game crashes and it can crash at certain points for no discernible reason. It tends to crash usually at 5, 6, maybe even 7 hours in for me at least. But yeah, keeping it quarterly keeps down the probability of um, crashes fucking over your game and also keeps down the probability of you falling to temptation of the save scum. Now that I haven't fallen to it multiple times. The multiplayer itself is basically single player but with other people. You host games and you join or you join them and basically from there you start things off. Basically, if I'm not mistaken, it is the Europa Universalis 4 method of doing things. Now, in terms of uh, starting a new game, be, be it single player or multiplayer, you have a set of options in terms of races, about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 varieties of races, two of them human, evil human and good human. Oof. And uh, six varieties of alien, but you also get the option to create your own custom take. Like for example, I created my take on the Imperium of Man, circa what is it, the second millennium, if it ever popped up then. Unfortunately, as far as I could tell, you cannot have an eternal god emperor quite yet. But I'm sure the modders will help because modding in this game is well supported. You can do quite a bit of uh, 3D modeling, modifications, if I'm not mistaken, quite a fair bit of um, script-based modifications and so on. So here's the hoping somebody goes like, if you want to play as the Imperium of Man and have completely accurate experience, comrade, here, have ship models that look like Imperial vessels, and here, have internal God Emperor, at best for you. Uh, the fact that the uh, the leader themselves start with a certain amount, well, a certain set of skills or attributes or better said traits, which impact your entire empire or federation or republic or whatever it is. The race traits themselves are what you what is most common in your faction. I've seen to a certain degree some variation, so I think it is possible to actually breed out certain traits over decades, probably, from your uh, civilization, but I haven't tried that yet. The only thing I've seen that, ma that changes quite substantially, if you allow it, is the ethics. I've seen my guys actually get an option on a planet when you're building a colonist ship either between a, a spir purely spiritualist group of colonists or a pure, or a pure, i.e. original fanatic xenophobe spiritualist group. Besides that, you also get your standard setup options for your galaxy. This is pretty much box standard for anybody who's ever played 4x games. Select the size, select the type, both these will probably be changed quite significantly by modders as well because, well, as I said, quite mod friendly. And I did hear one of the developers say this thing go, this game can support up to 5,000 stars, but they limited it. Let it. Damn, my tongue is tight today. They limited themselves to 1,000 stars to prevent the probability of 
more frequent cra crashes or gremlins or stuff like that. But expect mothers to do no such uh, due diligence in terms of thinking forward. We can have 5000, let's see if we can have 10k, brother! The AI empires are the amount of races you get which start at a sentient stage at the very least. I don't know if it includes Neolithic races as well, but it does include Bronze Age races. So basically, AI Empires is every race that's sentient, that has or doesn't have FTL. Advanced AI stars are the ones that have FTL. Now, the AI empires who don't have FTL do evolve towards FTL over time. So if you bump into one that's for example Bronze Age and they're slowly evolving but you don't want to tinker around with them too much and your space envelops them in time, I'd recommend actually absorbing them either via um, more subtle techniques or via infiltration which you get via observation outposts which you build around the respective planet or more brutal direct means via um, planetary invasion. I use planetary invasions because I am a fanatic xenophobe and a spiritualist so I get divine mandate. And divine mandate allows me to enslave people or other species without any well, without half as many fucks given, quite literally, about it. So it means I can have three or four enslaved races underneath my control at any one given time, at least. I've not actually expanded beyond that point to see if I get major effects from having too many slaves, because I've not ma made it past the middle stage of the game so far. The AI is quite Napoleonic in terms of intelligence at normal. I do not even want to see what hard or insane does to the AI. But do note that is normal is actually the easiest difficulty so I'm getting my ass stomped by pretty much what people would call easy AI. But in this game the AI is not stupid. It kind of actually knows what you are trying to do and it kind of reacts quite well. Have you ever seen it apply running uh, yeah, hit and run tactics against your fleets when I can't actually engage your main armada directly. But anyway, getting back to the talking. The, as I said, it's best to assimilate non-FTL empires as soon as possible. And the advanced AI stars include ones that have FTL or the ones that are actually super evolved super advanced fallen empires, i.e. empires that don't give much of a fuck outside of their borders unless you um, how should I put this? start encroaching into their borders via territory or start colonizing planets they hold holy in certain, with certain fallen empires. Do I have colonized one or two holy sites without getting pop stomped? So it might be that they have some tolerance, depends. Oh yeah, and the other two options, if FTL method is allowed, pretty much self-explanatory. The Iron Man mode is again pretty self-explanatory, one save to rule them all. The FTL methods themselves, just a, as a quick note, all have advantages and disadvantages. For me personally, I prefer the warp drive because again, I like to roleplay more or less and warp drives are what the Imperium of Man and Warhammer 40k use. And Holy Terra is a desert planet, so that's, well, more or less desert planet. Technically it would be a barren planet, but can't have that in the game. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yes, for low pace stuff. But the warp drives themselves, while well, you can go anywhere within your range, they have the disadvantage of cooling off. The other two also have advantages and disadvantages, but I'll let you guys discover them at your own pace because discovering stuff in this game is quite funny and also quite frustrating at times, but eh. Now I'm gonna show you guys some of my play in terms of um, 
different stages. This is the beginning stage of a game. This is what you start off with. One science vessel, one building vessel, a starport around your planet, which builds your fleets, and a fleet. A military fleet, to be precise. The military fleet, I'd recommend getting a couple more corvettes into your mix, because there's a slight possibility that you get a quest chain that has you dealing with seditious, a seditious faction from your planet that ran off into space and now has to now you have to deal with them directly militarily and when it triggers if it triggers because it doesn't always trigger you get um, how should I put this a military fleet in your solar system that'll hit anything that they can, it can they can beat so yeah having a hundred strong military power fleet is good because those guys usually have around 105 110 uh, at the outset of the game you can't colonize planets because you don't have even have um, the colony ship technology which you research in due time but for example with the tech trees being as they are you're not guaranteed having the option to actually research colony ship from the get-go for for me for example i've seen at least in, uh, as far as my playstyle goes that having physics labs bio labs and engineering facilities researched as quickly as possible which are upgrades to improve the specific type of output be it engineering social or physics based type research which again affects every category itself the more you have the faster things go having these research allows me to work my magic a bit better because it doesn't cause me to fall back in uh, not fall back um, lag in terms of research in terms of technology in terms of efficiency and so on the random nature of the um, uh, tech options you get though means you don't always have these options you don't always have the option to research the colony ship first go but it should crop up by the second or third um, society option yeah. so basically these options are somewhat completely random somewhat mostly because they take into account to a certain degree and yes I do love the word certain what you researched previously or what technologies you use or your faction started off with like for example if you start off with mass drivers on your ships like I did you get mass drivers available more often or more likely here you did not get well, here I did not get any but yeah it just affects the likelihood and you also get rare technologies which pop up very very infrequently and you should always keep an eye on them because if you do get one you really have a tough choice to make if you want something else or if you want that because in this game sometimes a normal technology right now will save your ass from getting curve stomped while a more advanced rare technology like for example having a clue how the hyperspace lane for hyperspace technology well hyperspace FTLs pardon the hyperspace lane themselves look in terms of mapping can mean a superlative long-term advantage in terms of knowing where to fortify if you're dealing with somebody who has hyperspace engines because those buggers are quite fucking fast you know, you'll have quite a fair bit of difficulty catching them with warp drives. With wormhole generators, they're basically fucked on as they attack you. Because wormhole generation technology is more stationary. So you're basically going to be using hybrid type tactics of sending an overwhelming fleet with a gate ship or gate capable building ship towards a targeted system. And if that doesn't work, you are pretty much screwed would be the operative term but wormhole technology itself does allow instantaneous pretty much near infinite distance travel so yeah pros and cons ladies and gentlemen pros and cons for me warp drive is basically the best of both hyperspace and wormhole
now let us load a more advanced one so I can get to showing you guys how I assimilate factions or better said societies in any societies into my own empire now as you see here I've already expanded quite a bit this is about 10 to 20 years in the future from the point I started if I'm not mistaken at this point I already had another one of the um, uh, quest chains pop up in a sense it's more of a event not so much a quest unlike the seditious element these are basically pirates and they always pop up they spawn a fleet and a more or less formidable space station this is an example of a more formidable one the three planets you see here is Sol which I started with Botine which I colonized fairly recently at this point in the game and Ejok which I invaded because it was populated by a race of aliens with no warp or FTL technology of any description so we decided huh we can always use rapid expansion techniques now personally when you invade them they get very unhappy unhappy people split off into factions factions can cause significant issues this is why being more of a di dictatorial dickhead like me and this is up until the medium stages of the game works quite well not too sure how I'm gonna balance things out but yeah I'm gonna do a let's play of the game so we're both gonna see I'm gonna deal with late stages fragmentation issues because I do plan on liberating some uh, slave societies once they start well, once they stop being such unhappy dickasses. This is Botane, and if I'm not mistaken, at Lacium we have a primitive Iron Age society to deal with. I.e. give them the option of integrating or, well, basically dying in fire. Technically, if I'm not mistaken, you can actually bombard them from space and eliminate them that way. But this is more of an efficient option because it increases the, the number of systems you have, the territory you have, and the pool of uh, labor. There's a lot of uh, stuff to deal with, with labor and sectors and stuff like that. And again, that's more for the tutorial and for you guys to discover. Suffice to say, it makes sense, it works. It's sort of a pain in the ass to deal with in certain respects, but nothing a fairly seasoned or even less novice Forex gamer can actually deal with. Now, with the ground invasions, unless it's an FTO society and it has a fortified planet, you basically land your armies directly on the ground and deal with it that way. With a FTL society, they usually fortify their planets against interstellar invasions. So that means you either have to soften the planet up for a massive scale invasion, pulp the planet in terms of fortifications and land a smaller force on it, or possibly if you have um, the breathing space to negotiate, actually leave it in peace but blockaded and incapable of doing anything and have them f see the planet later on. For me personally, invasion seem to work best when grabbing territory. Not anything too surprising here. The ground battles are automated like in uh, Master of Orion and the space combat is also automated like in Enemy planet secured. Uh, like in for example uh, Europa Universalis's stuff basically you don't control the battle you control who leads your forces into battle how good they are how good your forces are and then you pretty much 
prey. You can you do have the option of retreating, and if you can retreat and you have a reason to retreat, I recommend you do, because hit and run is more efficient in terms of uh, conquering and uh, dealing with FTL societies. Now the fact we conquer them violently will give them a stellar culture shock modifier, which makes them really, really freaking unhappy. But we have a very, very simple solution for unhappy people. You unhappy now? Okay. You even more happy uh, now, but you can't complain about it. And they really can't make any factions, at least as far as I know. The 40 or so hours I spent with the game was in the pre-launch version. This is version 1.0. So it actually did change on me, if I'm not mistaken, the day before yesterday. Now besides that, you, as I said, you have the option of um, building... where was that? An observation post, and the observation post itself has the option of infiltrating people into the planet to do rather interesting things to them. Basically, Illuminati type stuff, XCOM, our leaders have been replaced by disguised aliens, oh look, the aliens have landed, oh look, our leaders are sending over our planet to them, type shit. They're also quite unhappy with that one, so for me personally, it works to basically be like, okay, I invade you, if you're happy later, okay, I free you. If not, you stay slave, okay? Slave and slave populations cannot uh, produce research, but they do produce quite a bit of labor. So, yeah, plus and, uh, uh, plus and minus type balancing. But yeah, in terms of gameplay, that's up to the... How should I put this? near middle stage of the game this next one would be pretty much tending towards the middle stage of the game the last one was sort of flirting with it at this point I ran into a alien civilization and knowing what they do to me if I didn't block them i.e. they block me box me in as much as possible I built a, um, I colonized quickly a planet here, and I built a um, frontier outpost here, which the frontier outposts extend your territory, and basically box them in like that. They are extremely unhappy, though they were dealing with an alien species over here, so they weren't too militaristic, but when I realized they were actually dealing with these guys over here, I was like, okay, time to invade. I took this planet quickly and kept beating them in terms of uh, combat, taking taking out fleets, taking out mining outposts, taking out starports whenever I could, and they decided to um, peace out, ceding the planet to me permanently. In a war, you get basically three options. You either win, you either lose, or you have a white piece, which basically everything goes back the, the way it was. Never accept white pieces if you're actually winning. <laughs> Because you do lose everything you want, with no, with no benefits, and the aliens will probably declare war in within ten to twenty years when the truce expires and when they feel ready. Because these guys are quite Machiavellian. The second war uh, after the truce expired was also declared by me. At which point I basically had a fleet which was nearly twice as potent, and I basically rushed towards their central areas and kept trying to find their main battle fleet. Once I found their main battle fleet, I believe it was at Hiklam, I baited them out of position to be able to warp out because they're also warp capable. The warp and if I'm not mistaken hyperspace can't jump from anywhere in the system. I believe every single race has to actually get to the outskirts of the system. So I baited them in the middle of the system with a science ship, at which point my main battle suit warped in and shit started getting kicked in. At that point they weren't too happy, they were about 
40 to 50 percent into the red in terms of uh, war score because wars tend to be decided in the game by how much you destroy, how much you wreck the enemy. The more you wreck them and the less they wreck you, the more the war score goes towards your favor. If the war score actually hits, I believe, 100 against you, you lose. But I've never lost so far. At least I've never lost in terms of actual combat. I've gotten boxed in, I've gotten fucked over, but yeah. Once I destroyed the um, spaceport and around their main homeworld, they peaced out and accepted vassalization. And they also seeded another planet over here. They managed to actually completely annex the guys whom they were fighting during the first war. And this is actually one of the planets from the those guys. Wow, these guys are quite unhappy. Let's fix that, shall we? Let's see how unhappy you are now. But yeah, that's pretty much a decent presentation. The game gets freaking crazy at points and there's a lot of stuff I can't cover you know, for the sake of maintaining stuff, well, stuff, maintaining the video to as a compact size as possible because I actually tried with one of the previous recordings to explain as much as possible and I wasn't even at this point when I was at 50 minutes in and I didn't and I skip, still skipped a lot of stuff but suffice to say you do get crazier technologies like rim worlds and stuff like that and if you want to see insane stuff like that in your sessions without actually having to play that long you can have starts with um, more advanced AI starts because these dictate the probability that you'll have foreign empires and if I'm not mistaken the developers actually said that regular empires i.e. nascent ones if the game drags on long enough and they go that way they can actually become um, foreign empires as well basically retreating into themselves but yeah this is my overview of Stellaris and my first impressions is basically if Paradox continues on with this general direction of the game just adding in more things, adding in more features, adding in enriching everything fixing the flaws the game has like for example transport ships and space stations are a bit wonky in terms of upgrades if they do all that well, this game is already the best Forex game I've played in the decade. I can only imagine how good I can probably get if Paradox keep on this direction. And if they don't, if for some miracle they manage to lose the plot, so to say, they still gave a large amount of help and tools to the modding community. So there's always hope from that direction. So yeah, thank you for watching. And until next time, here's to hoping somebody makes a ship model pack for the, Imper the Imperium of Man, possibly the whole of Warhammer 40k, because I sure want to see some of that stuff. Oh, and buff the 